General Manuel Antonio Noriega, for six years the military strongman of Panama. He wielded the power of life and death. There were no redeeming qualities about Noriega. He was a thug. He had no principles whatsoever. The United States accused him of dealing drugs to the youth of America. America deposed him in a bloody invasion. He was taken in chains to Miami, where he was found guilty of drug smuggling. Today, Noriega is America's only prisoner of war. In his glory days, General Noriega was a military strongman who basked in the adulation of crowds. To hide his true nature, he drew a cloak of mystery around his life. He's such a strange man. The stories that were told about him, one didn't know where fact ended and, and fiction or invention. And I think the impression most of us had was that he liked to encourage the speculation about him that he found it sort of amusing. Even the date of his birth is disputed. Some say he was born in 1934, but the date he prefers is February the 11th, 1938, making him four years younger. Manuel Antonio Noriega was born in the market district of Panama City. It was a tough neighborhood where the poor lived on their wits. He was the illegitimate son of Maria Morena Mejia, a seamstress, and Thomas Noriega, a civil service accountant. Because Noriega's mother was working class and of mixed race, his white middle-class father could never have married her. Thomas Noriega deserted Maria, but provided her with money for their son's upbringing. Maria decided it would be easier to look after her baby by returning to her home village near the Colombian border. But soon after they arrived, tragedy struck. His mother caught tuberculosis and died when Noriega was less than a year old. A friend of his mother's took the boy in. Manuel Antonio spent the next two years in the village, and when he was four years old, an act of kindness took him back to Panama City. There, the young boy's life was to take a turn for the better. He was adopted by his aunt, Regina Delgado, who, together with her children and engineering husband, Jose, provided his first real family. They lived in an apartment in this building, beside the public market. Noriega was an ambitious child who wanted to be a leader, even when playing baseball with his friends. Every time we were going to play before we actually started, I used to take the bat and ball, climb on a chair and say, before we start, you've got to hear a speech of mine or a poem. And I used to do that. When I finished, they clapped and the game began. The Delgado family lived only a few hundred yards from the exclusive all-white union club. It was a world Noriega's background and color forever excluded him from. But it was the world to which his father belonged. He was insecure in that he knew he was not accepted by Panamanian society. Uh, there was just no way that the the traditional oligarchy could welcome him in their circles. He was to suffer a further setback when he developed chickenpox. He did not receive the best treatment and he was left with a badly scarred face. It earned him the enduring and unkind nickname of Lapina, Pineapple Face. He's a short, ugly man extremely ugly, and that would be a burden to anybody. 
a lot to overcome. Despite these problems, Noriega was determined and he studied hard. He went to the country's best public high school, the National Institute. This time, the National Institute was one of the best schools in town, in the, in the whole Republic of Panama. And the education he got was uh, very, very good. He was given a culture of interest in uh, humanities and the important things in life. In his school class book, Noriega recorded that his ambition was to become either a psychiatrist or the president of the country. His youthful desire to change the world led him to an interest in left-wing politics. He was very ambitious because uh, he uh, asked a group of us to join him in classes, political classes of socialism. He was uh, recruiting people to take uh, socialist lessons in a school. He wanted to be noticed. He wanted to be a leader. Noriega tried hard as a student, but despite his ambition, he failed in his dream to become a doctor. He was very average as a student. He never made the first grades. Even he, he couldn't uh, graduate on time. He had to go one year, another year, to school to graduate. And then he went to the uh, medicine school and spent one year there, and he failed. Noriega was disappointed but he picked himself up and went to work for a pharmacist who shared his left-wing ideology. He was a young man with big ideas, looking for a way to make his mark. It was the 1950s, and political debate centered on the Panama Canal, America's most vital trade link. The canal opened in 1914, linking the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. The United States built it, paid for it, and ran it. Panamanian resentment at United States control has simmered ever since. The young Noriega shared the prevailing anger. The strategic importance of the canal swept up Panama in the Cold War. Rumors of communist spies circulated widely. It was an oppressive atmosphere for an ambitious young man to grow up in. Noriega felt trapped. Help came from an unexpected quarter, his father's side of the family. His half-brother, Luis, was a Panamanian diplomat based in Peru. Luis discovered that Los Chorillos Military College in Lima was offering scholarships to foreign students. Noriega was keen to apply, but there was a problem. He was in his 20s and already over the age limit for entry. With his brother's help, he forged a birth certificate. At a stroke, he was four years younger. And so Noriega arrived in Lima, Peru, to make a new start in life. It was a fateful decision, both for him and for Panama. In 1958, Manuel Antonio Noriega became a student at Los Chorillos Military Academy in Peru. He was hoping to leave the hard times of Panama behind, but the regime at Los Chorillos was harsh and sadistic. La vida militar de, de esa época pero era, era muy estricta. Military life at that time was very strict. Life was very hard. You were always hungry, and at Chorrillos Military Academy, it was always cold. It was very hard. Noriega overcame the brutal discipline, and after four years, graduated in engineering with honors. He returned to Panama in 1961, determined to enjoy its easygoing lifestyle to the full. Uh, he was uh, like any other guy, having a drink, having a party, but uh, nothing uh, so noisy or anything like that. Uh, he likes to go to the warehouses and things like that, like any other uh, bachelor in town. Thanks to his engineering skills, he soon found a job as a surveyor, making charts of the Pacific coastline. Digo, bueno, ya esta va a ser mi rama, dice. I thought to myself, this is what I will do. But something unexpected happened, and it changed my life. 
1962, he visited a carnival in the seaport of Cologne. He went to look up an old friend who was a policeman stationed at the local National Guard barracks. While I was there, another man walked in. He was Major Torrijos Herrera, the chief of the Atlantic Zone. Omar Torrijos was a rising star in the National Guard. When he walked through the door, I, as a recently graduated cadet, instinctively stood to attention. And he looked at me and said, are you Noriega? And I said, yes, sir. He invited Noriega to a carnival night party. At the party, Torrijos expanded his vision of a more powerful National Guard, like an army, which would be on the side of the poor against the rich. He talked to me about his dreams. So I identified with his dreams and vice versa. And from that moment on, there was a permanent chemistry between chief and subordinate. Permanente. Flattered by Torrijos, Noriega joined the National Guard in May 1962. It was the beginning of a relationship between the charismatic career officer and the impressionable young man, almost like that of father and son. The National Guard was a hard and corrupt force. The young recruit's character appeared to be influenced by it and changed for the worse. There was something about Noriega that became publicly known. We discovered that when he was drinking or celebrating, he would hit women, prostitutes, for example. Lieutenant Noriega was charged with being brutal to prisoners and confined to barracks for 30 days. More seriously, he was accused of raping a prostitute. He was to escape trial, protected by his mentor, Major Torrijos. Even Noriega's friends found it difficult to understand the impulses that now drove him. It was a difficult guy. Even though I used to drink with him a lot of times and uh, been part with him a lot of times, he never wants to talk very much about anything. He doesn't want to say things that uh, will compromise him. He always trying to to get somebody to help him to get ahead, uh, but uh, always uh, was very secret uh, in everything that he does. Noriega was transferred to Chiriquí province, west of Panama City, in 1963. He continued to get into trouble. He was accused of raping a teenage girl, but again, Torrijos protected him. In 1965, life changed for Noriega when he met a local teacher and fell in love. Felicidad la conocí en, en mi traslado a Chiriquí. I met Felicidad when I transferred to Chiriquí through Torrijos. He introduced me to her after she had had a traffic accident and he told me to look after her. That is how I met her. They were married the following year and started a family. Felicidad came from the white middle classes. Her name means happiness, and she had a good influence on Noriega. He pulled himself together, and with Felicidad by his side, he was given the key job of head of regional intelligence in 1967. Shortly afterwards, he took on another job with the CIA. As a Panamanian intelligence officer, the Americans expected him to pass on information on possible left-wing targets. The United States even paid him a salary. He was one of many young officers to receive courses in anti-terrorism at a U.S. Army school in Panama. 
The courses were run by the United States as part of its battle against communism in Central and Latin America. Noriega was an excellent student. I received his report card for the course he took in psychological warfare at the School of the Americas, and he got the highest grade. And uh, I wasn't surprised. Uh, he, it's certainly a course that all of those military uh, would take. Uh, the United States put great emphasis on psychological warfare as part of the anti-communist war. Uh, and the one course that he failed utterly was uh, pathfinding in the forest. While Lieutenant Noriega honed his military and intelligence skills, in 1968 his mentor, Omer Torrijos, made his move to topple Panama's elected government. He was one of the leaders of a coup. Panama became a military dictatorship under Torrijos offering a new brand of nationalist politics built on a campaign to get America to hand over control of the Panama Canal. The United States was horrified at this turn of events. It lent support to a counter coup to oust the new dictator. The plotters waited until Torrijos visited Mexico to make their move. The threatened dictator needed loyal support. He found it in Noriega, who had been promoted to captain and now occupied the commander's office in David. Torrijos telephoned Noriega and asked for his help. Noriega did not hesitate. The coup plotters closed Panama's main airports to leave Torrijos stranded in Mexico. But Noriega ordered his troops to secure the small airfield at David and then they waited. Finally, a small aircraft appeared and the dictator had returned. Torrijos set off for Panama City, accompanied by Noriega and his troops. Crowds flooded to join him, swept up in nationalist fervor. The coup plotters caved in, and Torrijos made a triumphant return to the capital city. Noriega became one of Torrijos's most trusted aides, and the dictator referred to him affectionately as, my gangster. He said, Noriega is the he used to say, Noriega knows exactly what I want with just one look. We always had that chemistry. Noriega's career took off. He was promoted to lieutenant colonel and made head of military intelligence, or G2. He was Torrijos's eyes and ears, and he became immensely powerful. Uh, he had a book on everybody, uh, uh, on all of the political opposition and probably most of the political friends. And uh, he had the, the capacity to keep files and to tap phones. And uh, uh, it, it, I, I fully believe that he had something on just about everybody in town. Noriega had a fearsome reputation but the human rights record in Panama remained comparatively good. A threat was usually enough to silence an enemy. I, I had a small uh, newspaper, community newspaper, and I published that uh, near uh, church, there was uh, a meeting place of Noriega with his uh, cronies uh, to have women and uh, all kind of uh, or uh, orgies. Huh? So he got very mad about that. And uh, a week or two weeks later, two of his henchmen uh, took me uh, uh, against the wall, put me a gun in the mouth, and uh, told me to stop harassing Noriega, because if not, they would take care of me. Noriega's ruthless determination brought him to the attention of an American intelligence agent who reported, Noriega is intelligent, aggressive, ambitious, and ultra-nationalistic. He is a shrewd and calculating person. It should be of no surprise to one day find this officer in the position of Commandant of the National Guard. 
and perhaps a dictator of Panama. On July the 30th, 1981, the prediction moved towards fulfillment. General Torrijos's private plane crashed in the mountains of Panama. The general was killed. Speculation was rife that there had been a bomb on board and that Noriega had planted it. It's a measure of the aura surrounding Noriega's person that a vast number, possibly a majority of Panamanians, the man in the street, thought it was true that he had his a hand in Torrijos's death. So he was capable of anything and people assumed that therefore probably had something to do with it. Noriega denied involvement. The way was now clear for him to step from behind his mentor's shadow. In 1981, Panama was engulfed in uncertainty. The dictator, General Torrijos, had died in a plane crash, and there was a struggle to become his successor. Rumors swirled around Panama that Noriega had killed Torrijos by blowing up his plane. Noriega has always denied involvement, and an official inquiry concluded that the crash was an accident. After two years, Colonel Noriega emerged as the country's new strongman. But he was still an outsider, and he took pleasure in causing discomfort to members of the ruling elites. There was a stairway from the street level up to the Comandancia, to the office level. Uh, maybe 15 or 20 stairs, one of which, near the top, was at a different level than the others, so that every single uh, new first arrival stumbled. Uh, and this always then caused some stir among the otter guard that was standing at the top, and also brought a great smile of relief to Noriega, who would then be standing beyond, ready to greet the, the visitor. I certainly didn't know about it the first time I we went. Nobody gave me a, a heads up on it and went splat. <laughs> I think it caused him enormous satisfaction. Noriega was not the official head of state, but as head of the military, he was the undisputed power behind the scenes. At no time was this better illustrated than in 1984, when the first presidential elections were held since he came to power. There was widespread vote breaking, and Noriega's candidate was declared the winner. The American government reluctantly continued to back Noriega, seeing him as a strong anti-communist defender of the Panama Canal and an important asset for the CIA. In the words of our Latin American division chief, you have one client in Panama as the chief of station, and that is the general. And it was, it was said, you don't have to like the guy, uh, you don't have to be his friend, but uh, it was expected that we would have a, a professional and harmonious intelligence relationship. Noriega luxuriated in the good life and basked in the adulation of friends and cronies. And when he held elaborate birthday parties, the CIA chief would be an honored guest. And he sat me down next to him, space that had been reserved for me. The amazing thing was uh, for about the next hour, people would come up. It was just like, like something out of the Godfather movie. People would come up and they'd bend down and say, oh, you know, Aunt Martha sends her greetings and regards and we wish you the happiest and so on and so forth. And then they'd slide an envelope uh, and the general would rather discreetly put his hand over it or, or stuff it in the inside of his jacket pocket. And uh, it, it really, it, it was a, an incredible scene. Noriega was fated in public and his wife, Felicidad, fulfilled the role of a gracious first lady. The Noriegas had three daughters, but Noriega, in macho tradition, also kept a mistress.
In the early 1980s, Panama was an oasis of peace in a region torn by violence. Wars had broken out in Nicaragua and El Salvador, and the trade in cocaine had grown to pay for them. Gun runners, spies and drugs slipped through Panama. Noriega kept watch for America. Panama is a crossroads for all sorts of nefarious individuals. You would say to him, um, you know, we're, we're interested in, in this individual or we want to know the w movements or whereabouts of somebody. And uh, with that kind of uh, uh, specific detail, he was, uh, he was quite good. At no time did he ever refuse. Noriega carried out secret work for America when he visited Fidel Castro in Cuba. The United States and Cuba did not have diplomatic relations, and Noriega acted as both spy and intermediary. He traveled to Cuba, met with Fidel Castro. When he first told me about it, uh, I notified my headquarters, and of course, knowing that General Noriega was going to meet privately with Fidel Castro, uh, they had a number of uh, questions that they wanted posed. The head of the CIA, Bill Casey, thanked Noriega personally for his intelligence cooperation. Noriega liked to cooperate with America. He thought it was good for relations. When Panamanian troops discovered a cocaine factory built by Colombian drug dealers deep in the Panamanian jungle, he informed the United States Drug Enforcement Agency and had the laboratory destroyed. persistent rumors circulated that Noriega was himself involved in drug running. One of the biggest scandals of his career erupted out of accusations that he had connections with narcotics smugglers. It began when an old political opponent returned from self-imposed exile and took a bus to Panama City. Dr. Hugo Spadafora was a ruthless revolutionary who modeled himself on Che Guevara. He hoped to bring down Noriega by making public allegations that the general was a drug dealer. The National Guard intercepted Hugo Spadafora's bus and the doctor was arrested and led away. The last time my brother was seen alive, he was in the hands of security agents from the Panamanian army under the command of General Noriega. Hugo Spadafora's headless body was found in a postal sack dumped across the Costa Rican border. Noriega denied involvement, and he had the perfect alibi. General Manuel Antonio Noriega had left the Republic of Panama and was, at that time, in England. Spadafora's murder caused revulsion. The American government was now becoming increasingly disillusioned with their friendly dictator. In 1985, General Noriega faced his first major crisis. Opposition was growing following the murder of his political enemy, Hugo Spadafora. Such was his power in the country that nothing could be done in Panama without him knowing about it. That is why we always accuse him of a brother's murder, because something like that could not have been done without his consent. Noriega was conveniently outside the country at the time. Uh, a, there are those who assume that Noriega, because he was head of the Panamanian Defense Force at that point, must have been consulted before the order was given to the agents to murder Spadafora. I don't know if that's true or not. Noriega ignored his critics and concentrated on turning the National Guard into an army called the Panamanian Defense Force. But his enemies were about to launch an attack no army could resist. Panama's secret banking laws had made it a safe haven for Colombian drug profits and American investigators had begun to examine Noriega's alleged complicity. In February 1988, 
a Miami court indicted him on drug charges. Son acusaciones políticas, definitivamente, con, eh, totalmente. They are definitely political accusations, completely, because each Panamanian action under my command was known to the whole of the North American forces, and they were in on it, all of them, Interpol, DEA, FBI. Panama was like an open book. Noriega's claims did not convince the American government. It dispatched a delegation to talk tough to the general. We told him that his behavior was getting worse and worse. That is, there was more corruption, uh, there were more human rights abuses, uh, and there was more drug trafficking in Panama, and that he was responsible for this, and that he had to stop it. What he said was, you people spend all your time in Panama City with the millionaires uh, at their beach houses. And you go to their cocktail parties and you go to their clubs. And they tell you all these terrible things about me. But let me tell you something. You go out there in the countryside and you ask the people of Panama whether they want those millionaires in power or me. And you'll see who they want. And you'll see whether you're listening to the true voice of the people or just your, your buddies in the elites in Panama City. Now, that was a very good speech, in part because it was largely true. But Noriega had many enemies close to home. One of those closest to him was about to deal him a serious blow. His second in command, Colonel Bobby Diaz Herrera, tried to depose Noriega, but failed. Noriega responded by kicking him out of the army. Diaz Herrera responded by publicly accusing Noriega of killing Hugo Spadafora. I informed General Noriega that he was a criminal, that he had stained the honor of the army and the entire organization resembled a den of gangsters, that Noriega ordered the troops in Chiriquí to carry out the crime against Hugo Spadafora. That was a clear thing, very definite, and it was one of those decisive moments. Diaz Herrera's accusations became public and protesters took to the streets. Faced with civil unrest, Noriega reacted with force, repressing the very people he claimed to represent. The self-styled populist leader reacted like a brutal dictator. To defuse the situation, President Reagan began negotiations with Noriega to try to persuade him to stand down as head of the Panamanian military. What is your alternative? Here was Mr. Reagan, President of the United States, busily directing the negotiations to remove General Noriega from control of the Panamanian Defense Forces. In the meantime, Vice President Bush is saying, if it were me, I would not have anything to do with a man such as that, and I certainly wouldn't be negotiating with him. Noriega complained he was receiving confused signals from the Americans, with one branch of the American government appearing to be his friend, while another wanted to put him in jail for drug running. He was right to feel that there were conflicting messages, because he had the State Department saying, get rid of this guy, this guy's awful. But he had a fairly friendly CIA, and he had a very friendly Defense Department, very friendly Defense Department. And their message to us at State was, don't give me your Boy Scout campaigns about human rights. We've got 10,000 Americans down there. We have to take care of them. He takes care of them. He's our friend. Noriega finally broke off negotiations, exasperated by America's mixed signals. That's when his fate was sealed. Because when he said no to Reagan, and, and Bush at this point is screaming bloody murder, don't let him weasel out of this, don't let him escape, he's got to go to jail. And when he said no to Reagan, who would have let him out if he had just left the country, it was all over. And the question really was, well, how fast is the clock running? The end, in a certain sense, was inevitable. 1988 ended with George Bush elected president. Noriega was now facing a more determined adversary. Unaware of Bush's argument with Reagan, the American press accused the vice president of being a wimp. 
Bush was to prove his critics wrong at a high cost to Noriega. In 1989, General Noriega was under attack both at home and in America. Early in the year, Panama went to the polls to elect a new president. To prevent election fraud, a team of foreign observers was present. It included former US President Jimmy Carter. Under their careful eye, it was impossible to rig the election. Noriega simply declared his candidate had won, sparking widespread demonstrations. Three days after the election, the army violently broke up opposition demonstrations. Vice presidential candidate Guillermo Ford was attacked by government thugs and his bodyguard was shot dead. All hell broke loose. Well, that's when my bodyguard was shot dead inside my car and I jumped through the bucket seat of the, uh, of the car, the station wagon, and I jumped out to the sidewalk. They punched me twice, threw me back in the seat of the car. I was not there. Physically, I was draining a lot of uh, blood. And then this other thug tried to hit me by surprise uh, with an iron bar. He was not very successful. I punched him back. I don't know how. They pulled two tendons. I had uh, about 14 stitches here on the face and 19 stitches in the back of my head. I was put in a police car and took into jail, and I spent the whole night in jail. The incident reverberated around the world, and President Bush decided to rid Panama of General Noriega. In October, the United States backed a coup staged by a group of Panamanian officers. While the plotters attacked Noriega's headquarters, U.S. Army units blocked off the surrounding roads. The plotters arrested Noriega, but their nerve gave way and they released him. The coup collapsed and Noriega had the ten ringleaders executed. Los norteamericanos, el imperio, quiere acabar con las pirañas y con el canal de Panamá. Suspicion reigned. Noriega no longer believed that America would hand over control of the canal as agreed by the end of the century. And America no longer thought Noriega could be trusted to keep the canal open in a crisis. Noriega, in a rhetorical flourish, declared war on America. When it came to the big stage, which was really only Central America and the United States, he made such colossal errors of judgment, uh, of timing, uh, of unnecessary bombast, that uh, it, it really contributed to, to his downfall. On December the 20th, 1989, George Bush gave the order to invade. 12,000 American troops flew into Panama. Stay down, stay down. Many attempts have been made to resolve this crisis through diplomacy and negotiations. All were rejected by the dictator of Panama, General Manuel Noriega. Noriega's headquarters was blown to pieces. resistance was almost non-existent. Noriega vanished and went into hiding. For four days, the US Army searched Panama City for the vanished dictator. Then he was discovered lying low at the Vatican Embassy, where he had sought diplomatic sanctuary. The United States Army tried to force the general out by playing highly amplified rock music day and night. As an old psychological warfare expert himself, Noriega would not have missed the irony. He sat tight. The United States assured General Noriega that he would not be executed, and after several days, he gave himself up. At nightfall, the dictator left the embassy and was escorted to a U.S. Army helicopter. He was flown to captivity inside the American-controlled canal zone. The cost of the invasion had been high, 
At least 400 Panamanian civilians and soldiers were dead. 23 American soldiers also died. Oh, it was tragic. I'm glad they got Noriega, but I thought it was tragic the way it happened. Uh, because we went into a country and, and uh, with considerable loss of, of life and uh, damage and so on. In Panama, there's a mixed feeling about this because they, they relied on us to free them from this monster. Uh, at the same time, it's pretty tough to have, a, to have a foreign invasion group come in and do the job. Noriega was flown from Panama to Miami, Florida to stand trial on drug charges. The seizure of Noriega and his removal to the United States to face civil charges is almost without precedent in, in the world. You could probably go back to Mary, Queen of Scots, where th and then you would find the case in which the uh, chief of state of one country is brought to another country and imprisoned. The trial was controversial. The only evidence against Noriega came from convicted drug traffickers who testified in return for reduced sentences. Noriega pleaded not guilty. The government called numerous convicted narcotics traffickers. The general's trial was the greatest get-out-of-jail-free card there ever was. Word spread through every prison in this country that if you want to get out of jail, all you have to do is say something bad about General Noriega. The trial lasted nine months. Finally, the jury declared Noriega guilty, and the judge sentenced him to 40 years in jail. As the Bible says, each day brings its own fate. I will see what tomorrow brings. I take it one day at a time. There is a final twist to Noriega's story. He is a convict in a general's uniform with the unique status of prisoner of war. Panama's most notorious son is unlikely ever to see his homeland again. He, he has not left a following. Uh, there perhaps are people who think that, that he doesn't deserve to spend the rest of his life in jail, uh, but I don't think they want him to come back and lead a political movement.